that it was true from my childhood, and how doubtful was the entire structure of thought which I had built upon them. I therefore understood that I must, if I wanted to establish anything at all in science that was firm and liable to last, once and for all rid myself of all the opinions I had adopted, and start from an entirely new foundation. Meditations 1. A multitude of laws often hampers justice, so that a state is best governed when it has only a few laws which are strictly administered. Similarly, Instead of the large number of laws which make up logic, I was of the opinion that the four following laws were perfectly sufficient for me, provided I took the firm and unwavering resolution to stick to them clearly at all times. The first was never to accept anything as true if I did not clearly know it to be so, that is, carefully to avoid precipitate conclusions and preconceptions, and to include nothing more in my judgment than was presented clearly and distinctly to my mind, so that I had no reason to doubt it. The second, to divide each of the difficulties I examined into as many parts as possible, and as might be necessary for a proper solution. The third, to conduct my thoughts in an orderly fashion, by starting with the simplest and most easily known objects, so that I could ascend, little by little and step by step, to more complex knowledge, and by giving some order even to those objects which appeared to have none. And the last, always to make enumerations so complete, and reviews so comprehensive, that I could be sure of leaving nothing out. Discourse on Method, Part 1 The long chains of simple and easy reasonings which geometers use to reach the most difficult conclusions had given me reason to suppose that all things which can be known by humanity are connected in some way and that there is nothing so far removed from us as to be beyond our reach, or so hidden that we cannot discover it, as long as we abstain from accepting the false for the true, and always preserve in our thoughts the order necessary for the deduction of one truth from another. Also, I had little difficulty in determining the objects with which it was necessary to commence, for I was already convinced that these must be the simplest and easiest known. Discourse on Method, Part 2 since I desired to devote myself wholly to the search for truth, I thought it necessary to reject as if utterly false anything in which I could discover the least grounds for doubt, so that I could find out if I was left with anything at all which was absolutely indubitable. Thus, because our senses sometimes deceive us, I decided to suppose that nothing was really as they led us to believe it was. And, because some of us make mistakes in reasoning, committing logical errors in even the simplest matters of geometry, I rejected as erroneous all reasonings that I had previously taken as proofs. And finally, when I considered that the very same things we perceive when we are awake may also occur to us while we are asleep, and not perceiving anything at all, I resolved to pretend that anything that had ever entered my mind was no more than a dream." But immediately I noticed that while I was thinking in this way, and regarding everything as false, it was none the less absolutely necessary that I, who was doing this thinking, was still something. And observing that this truth, I think, therefore I am, was so sure, and certain that no ground for doubt, be it ever so extravagantly sceptical, was capable of shaking it, I therefore decided that I could accept it without scruple, as the first principle of the philosophy I was seeking to create. Discourse on Method, Part 4 There is a vast difference between the mind and the body, in that the body by its very nature is always divisible, while the mind is completely indivisible. For when I consider the mind, or rather when I consider myself simply as a thinking thing, I find I can distinguish no parts within myself, and I clearly discern that I am a thing utterly one and complete. Although my whole mind seems to be united to my whole body, when a foot or an arm or any other part is severed, I am not conscious of anything having been removed from my mind. Nor can the faculties of willing, perceiving, conceptualizing, and so forth, in any way be called parts of the mind, as it is always the same mind which is doing the willing, perceiving, conceptualizing, and so forth. Meanwhile, utterly the opposite holds for all corporeal or extended things, for I cannot imagine any one of them which I cannot in my thoughts easily split into parts, and thus I understand that it is divisible. Meditations 6 
good sense is most evenly distributed among all humanity. For all consider themselves to be so well endowed with it, that even those who complain of their lot in all other ways seldom express the desire for more good sense. And here it is unlikely that every one is mistaken. It shows, rather, that the power of correct judgment, and the ability to distinguish truth from error, what we properly call good sense or reason, is by nature equally given to all humanity. As a result, the diversity of our opinions does not arise from any of us being endowed with a greater quantity of reason, but solely because we direct our thoughts in different directions, and do not pay attention to the same things. For it is not enough just to have a fine mind. The main thing is to learn how to apply it properly. The finest minds are capable of both the greatest vices as well as the greatest virtues, and those who travel slowly often make better progress as long as they follow the right path than those who rush ahead and stray from it. Discourse on Method, Part 1 of The nature of clear and distinct perception there are some people who throughout their entire lives perceive nothing in the correct fashion so as to be capable of judging it properly. The knowledge upon which a certain and incontrovertible judgment can be based must not only be clear but also distinct. Whatever is present and apparent to an attentive mind I call clear, in the same fashion as we assert that we see objects clearly when they are present to our gazing eye and make a strong impression upon it. But a thing that is distinct is so precise and different from all other objects that it contains within itself nothing else but what is clear. Principles of Philosophy Principle 45 Chronology of Descartes' Life 1596 René Descartes, born March the 31st 1606 Enters Jesuit College at La Fleche 1614-1616 Studies for law degree at Poitiers. 1618. Joins Army of the Prince of Orange in Holland. Meets physicist Beekman. 1619 to 1628. Travels through Europe. Studying from the Book of the World. 1619. Has dreams which convince him to dedicate his life to thought. 1620. Conceives of his universal method in a stove in Bavaria. 1622 to 1624. Moves to Paris. Meets Father Mersin, who is in correspondence with many of the great minds of Europe. 1628. Moves to the Netherlands. 1633. Writes Le Monde, the world, but suppresses publication after the Church condemns Galileo. 1635. Birth of Descartes' daughter, Francine. 1637. Publishes Discourse on Method. 1640. Death of his daughter causes Descartes profound grief. 1641. Publishes Meditations on the First Philosophy, which contains his famous assertion, Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. 1648. Death of his friend Father Mersenne in Paris. 1649. Travels to court of Queen Christina in Sweden. 1650. Dies in Stockholm on February the 11th. Chronology of Descartes' Era. 1598. Edict of Nantes grants toleration to Huguenots, French Protestants. 1599. Birth of Velasquez. 1600. Population of Europe reaches 100 million, having doubled in previous 150 years. 1600s. French begin settling Canada. 1605. Francis Bacon publishes Advancement of Learning, which proposes scientific method in place of Aristotelianism. 1607. Founding of Jamestown in America. 1609. Founding of Bank of Amsterdam breaks monopoly of private banking families. 1616. Death of Cervantes. Death of Shakespeare. 1618. Start of the Thirty Years' War, which spreads throughout Europe. 1620. Pilgrim Fathers reach Cape Cod. 1621. United Provinces of the Netherlands at war with Spain. 1624. French Parlement passes decree forbidding attacks on Aristotle on pain of death. 
1628, Harvey publishes work describing circulation of the blood. 1629, Peace after religious wars in France. 1639, Birth of Racine. 1642, Death of Galileo, Birth of Newton. 1646, Birth of Leibniz. 1648, End of Thirty Years' War, leaving large parts of Europe, especially Germany, devastated. 1649. Revolution in England deposes Charles I. Chronology of significant philosophical dates. 6th century BC. The beginning of Western philosophy, with Thales of Miletus. End of the 6th century BC. Death of Pythagoras. 399 BC, Socrates sentenced to death in Athens. Circa 387 BC, Plato founds the Academy in Athens, the first university. 335 BC, Aristotle founds the Lyceum in Athens, a rival school to the Academy. 324 AD, Emperor Constantine moves capital of Roman Empire to Byzantium. 400 AD. Saint Augustine writes his Confessions, philosophy absorbed into Christian theology. 410 A.D. Sack of Rome by Visigoths heralds opening of Dark Ages. 529 A.D. Closure of Academy in Athens by Emperor Justinian marks end of Hellenic thought. Mid 13th century, Thomas Aquinas writes his Commentaries on Aristotle, era of scholasticism. 1453, fall of Byzantium to Turks, end of Byzantine Empire. 1492, Columbus reaches America, Renaissance in Florence and revival of interest in Greek learning. 1543, Copernicus publishes on the revolution of the celestial orbs, proving mathematically that the Earth revolves around the Sun. 1633. Galileo forced by Church to recant heliocentric theory of the universe. 1641, Descartes publishes his Meditations, the start of modern philosophy. 1677, death of Spinoza allows publication of his Ethics. 1687, Newton publishes Principia, introducing concept of gravity. 1689. Locke publishes essay concerning human understanding, start of empiricism. Seventeen ten, Berkeley publishes Principles of Human Knowledge, advancing empiricism to new extremes. Seventeen sixteen, Death of Leibniz. Seventeen thirty nine to seventeen forty, Hume publishes Treatise of Human Nature, taking empiricism to its logical limits. Seventeen eighty one. Kant, awakened from his dogmatic slumbers by Hume, publishes *Critique of Pure Reason*. Great era of German metaphysics begins. 1807, Hegel publishes *The Phenomenology of Mind*, high point of German metaphysics. 1818, Schopenhauer publishes *The World as Will and Representation*, introducing Indian philosophy into German metaphysics. 1889, Nietzsche, having declared God is dead, succumbs to madness in Turin. 1921, Wittgenstein publishes Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, claiming the final solution to the problems of philosophy. 1920s, Vienna Circle propounds logical positivism. 1927, Heidegger publishes Being and Time. Heralding split between analytical and continental philosophy. 1943, Sartre publishes *Being and Nothingness*, advancing Heidegger's thought and instigating existentialism. 1953, posthumous publication of Wittgenstein's *Philosophical Investigations*, high era of linguistic analysis. This concludes the reading of Descartes in ninety minutes by Paul Strathern. The book was read by Robert Whitfield. For other audio books from the Philosophers in Ninety Minutes series, 
or if you'd like to obtain a complete printed catalogue of our titles or our monthly update telling you about new releases and our new collection of books on CD, write to Blackstone Audiobooks, P.O. Box 969, Ashland, Oregon 97520, or call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's 1-800-729-2665. You may also obtain the same information from our award-winning website. Our address, all one word, is www.blackstoneaudio.com. Thank you.